Hello there and welcome to part two of this uh, first look exploring session by Beyond Shakespeare, looking at The Brazen Age by Thomas Haywood, which was written in 1613. Uh, if you didn't see part one, there was all sorts of uh, classical shenanigans going on. It was a, it was a bit of a, a, a famous uh, legends mashup, uh, which according to some people was a jolly romp and according to others was a bit of a stodgy mess. Which is it? You decide for yourself. Go and watch part one if you haven't already. Uh, yesterday we finished with Jason uh, announcing to uh, everybody that he was just about to sail off on the Argonauts and inviting all his princely fellows to go with him. So we're picking it up now with the prologue to Act 3 and helping me decipher my way through all this brazenness today are these wonderful readers. Reading the part of Priam, he Aetes, Castor, and Gallus is. Hi, I'm Eric, and I only know who two of these people are. <laughs> I don't know who any of them are, so you're ahead of me. Uh, reading the part of Anchises, Jason, Theseus, and Phoebus is. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Famisu. I don't know who any of my parts are, and I'm an author from Romford. Reading the roles of Homer, Aeneas, Telamon, Absurtus, and Aurora is. Alan, confused in Suffolk. Uh, reading Hercules and Lord is. Hello, Helen Good, equally confused but in Hull. Reading Hesione, uh, Laomedon, Medea, Nestor, and Venus is. Rachel, uh, I know who two of my parts are. And uh, I am Sarah Blake. I am reading Mars in Act 4 and I shall be hosting uh, the broadcast for Act 3. Uh, and then for Act 4, I shall be passing over the baton to Helen, who will take over for the second half <coughs> of the play. And both of us are covering for Robert Crichton, your usual host, who will return uh, in due course. So let's pick it up with the Act 3 prologue and we begin, as before, with Homer. Lest not even kings against the gods contest, lest in this fall their ruins be expressed. Think Hercules, from cleansing the foul stall and stable of Augeas, in which fed three hundred oxen, never freed at all till his arrive, returned where he was bred to Thebes. There Dianara him receives with glad embraces, but he stays not long. Jason. The lady of her lord bereaves, for in the new-rigged Argo, with the young and sprightly heroes, he at Colchos names, where the rich fleece must publish their high fames. And enter Deonera and Lycus, to her Hercules received with joy after the presentment of some of his labours. To them march in all the Argonauts, Jason, Telamon, Atreus, Castor, Pollux, Theseus, etc., Jason persuades Hercules to the adventure. He leaves Deonara and marcheth off with the Argonauts. Imagine now these princes under sail, steering their course as far as high reared Troy, when King Laodamon doth much bewail his daughter, whom a sea whale must destroy. Observe this well, for here begins the jar made Troy wrapped after into a ten years' war. Sound, enter King Laomedon, Anchises, young Priam, Aeneas, Hesione, bound with other lords and ladies. Hesione, this is thy last on earth, whose fortunes we may mourn, though not prevent. Would Troy, whose walls I did attempt to rear, had grown, had near grown higher than their ground fills or in their foundation buried been and lost, since their high structure must be thus maintained with blood of our bright ladies. O oh, Hesione, the only remainder of these female dames begot by us, I must bequeath thy body to be the food of Neptune's monstrous whale. Had you kept troth and promise with the gods, this had not chanced. You borrowed of the priests of Neptune and Apollo, sea and sun, that quantity of gold which to this height and spacious compass hath immured great Troy. 
with the work finished, you denied to pay the priest's their due, for which enraged Neptune assembled his high tides, thinking to drown our lofty buildings and to ruin Troy. But when the moon, by which the seas are governed, retired his waters by her powerful wane, he left behind him such infectious slime, which the sun poisoning by his puissant beams, they, by their mutual powers, <laughs> raised a hot plague to slack this hot pest. Neptune made demand, monthly a lady to be chose by lot, to glut his huge sea monster's ravenous jaws. The lot this lady fell, the, the lot this day fell on Hesione, our beauteous sister. Priam, tis too true, till now Laomedon ne'er knew his guilt, or thought the gods could punish. Royal father, mourn not for me. The gods must be appeased, and I in this am happy that my death is made the atonement between those angry powers and your afflicted people, though my innocence never deserved such rigor from the gods. Come, good, and she sees, bind me to this rock, and let my body glut the insatiate fury of angry Neptune and the offended sun. A more unwilling monster never passed Anchises' hand. Now, now, the time draws nigh that my sweet child by Neptune's wail must die. The very thought of it swallows my heart as deep in sorrow as the monster can bury my sister. And there is a great shout within. Soft, what clamors that? Stately ship. Well rigged with swelling sails, enters the harbour, bound, by their report, for Colchos. But when they beheld the shores, covered with multitudes, and spied from far, your beauteous daughter fastened to the rock, they made to know the cause, which, certified, one noble Greek among these heroes stands, and offers to encounter Neptune's wail, and free from death the bright Hesion. Thou hast, Aeneas, quickened me from death and added to my date a second age. Admit them. Uh, but before we admit them, we're just going to take a, a little pause there to uh, just check what's going on. So, um, yes, accor uh, according to my copy of the text, this is all still the prologue, but I think there's just, uh, yeah, I think we should have maybe just had a scene change after, after Homer finished his stuff. So we started with some dumb show, and now we've gone into um, this court scene where there's a maid tied to a rock uh, about to be devoured in a ritual sacrifice to a sea monster. Now, where have I heard this before? <laughs> where haven't you heard it before? <laughs> exactly, exactly. We, we were saying yesterday about how often women's um, violence against women and trauma uh, against women is, uh, the, uh, is the sort of catalyst uh, for the plot of so many um, stories and uh, here we are again folks <laughs> only only this time it's um who's the king Pr uh priam no priam mm. is the sister priam is the brother uh, uh Leia maiden. The, yes and Leia maiden is the father um but you know it it, 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 it could be any king in any kind of <laughs> classical myth thought so far anybody anyone got any burning issues anyone want to go into the dynamic of this relationship helen yes it's interesting that this particular sea monster is called a whale yeah um that i i hadn't particularly come across before except of course for jonah mm. um and the and his problems with nineveh uh what was that uh, something for london a uh, looking glass for London was looking it? glass for yeah. London. Yep, yeah. that was enter Jonah as from the whale. Yeah, but um, but no, it's it's. I mean, you've got Perseus, you've got Lily, uh, in, in Galatea, where where of course the, the the monster declines the offering, which is a different take on it. Um, but no, it's it it. The thing that caught my mind was the use of the word whale. Mm. Yes, it's it, yeah, 
because of Jonah, it strikes us as more biblical than classical, doesn't it? Um, Alan? Did we not have a, a sea monster or a whale or some sort off the coast of Lincolnshire or Hull or that area in something else we read? That, that was Galatea. That, that was, was Lily. Yeah. yeah. Right. But and yes. that, again, that was Neptune. Uh, but uh, but it was uh, yeah, angry Neptune, angry sent Neptune. a sea monster. Mm -hmm. But the point, the problem with that was that she was, she was only the third runner up mm. in the most beautiful maiden competition. So the sea monster rejected her. A sad reflection. Mm. Eric. Um, yeah, and also, like, I, I like that the reason for this is because they owed the, the priests money. Mm. Um, well, at least I, I think that's what, yeah, because yeah. the and work this... finished, you denied to pay the priests their due, which mm. um, basically caused chaos and sent off, like, you know, pay, paid the church. Um... <laughs> and also, Troy seems to have been covered with stinky slime. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, um... you know, is not going to make anybody's day, frankly. Yeah. But also, I was going to say that actually this theme exists in um, Cypriot folk song as well. <laughs> Random. Ah. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of, uh, well, not the whole sacrificing, um, like tying someone to a rock kind of thing, but it's very much the, oh, the princess must die and therefore a saint uh, descends from heaven to save her. That kind of thing. Yes, there's always... Uh... There's always somebody who's going to rush in and, and, and do the rescuing. And in this case, we have not one uh, hero, but uh, oh, several. So uh, moving on, unless anyone has anything else to add. Enter, drum roll please, <sighs> Hercules and Jason and Castor and Pollux and Theseus and all the Argonauts. Tis told to me thy name's Laomedon. And that thy beauteous daughter must this day feed a sea monster. How wilt thou reward the man that shall encounter Neptune's whale, tug with that fiend upon thy populous strand, and with my club souse on his armoured scales? Hast thou not heard of Theban Hercules? I that have awed the earth and ransacked hell, will through the ocean hunt the god of streams and chase him from the deep abysms below. I'll dare the sea god from his watery deeps if he take part with this leviathan. Thy name and courage warlike Heracles assures her life if thou wilt undertake this haughty quest. Two milk-white steeds, the best Asia air bred, shall be thy valor's prize. We accept them. Keep thy faith, Laomedon. If thou but breakst with Jove-born Hercules, these marble structures built with virgin's blood, I'll raise even with the earth. When comes the monster? And there is a cry within. I see him sweep the seas along, blow rivers through his nostrils as he glides, as if he meant to quench the sun's bright fire and bring a palped darkness o'er the earth. He opes his jaws as if to swallow Troy, and at one yawn whole thousands to destroy. Fly, fly into the city and exeunt all the Trojans. Take along this beauteous lady. If he must have prey, instead of her, Alcides here will stay. The heartless Trojans fly into the town at sight of yon sea devil. Here will stand to wait the conquest of thy jovial hand. Gramercy, Jason. See, he comes in tempest. I'll meet him in a storm as violent, and with one stroke which this right hand shall aim, ding him to the abyss from whence he came. Hercules kills the sea monster, the Trojans yeah. on the walls, the Greeks below. The monster is slain, my beauteous sister freed. Be ever for this noble deed renowned, let Asia speak thy praise. The Argonauts are glorified by this victorious act. 
Oh, Troy shall consecrate the Heracles uh, uh, temples and altars. Let's descend and meet him. Stay. None presume to stir. We'll parlay them first from the walls. Why doth not Troy's king from those walls descend? And since I have redeemed Hesione, present my travails with two milk-white steeds, the prize of my endeavours. Heracles, we owe thee none. None will, ten none will we tender thee. Thou hast won the honour, a reward sufficient for thy attempt. Our gates are shut against thee, nor shall you enter, you are Greekish spies, and come to pry, but where our land is weak. Oh, royal father. Peace, boy. Greeks away, for imminent death attends on your delay. The sea ne'er bred a monster half so vile as this land fiend. Death threaten Hercules? Would universal Troy were in one frame, that I might whelm it on thy cursed head and crown thee in thy ruin. Menace us. Depart our walls, or we will fire your Argo, lying in our harbor, and prevent your purpose in the achievement of the Golden Fleece. Laomedon, I'll toss thee from thy walls, Batter thy gates to shivers with my club, nor will I leave these broad Scamander plains till thy aspiring towers of Ilium lie level with the place on which we stand. Great Hercules, then venture forth to me. Our voyage bent for Colchos, not for Troy, the Golden Fleece, and not Laomedon. Why should we hazard here on our Argonauts? or spend ourselves on accidental wrongs. Jason advised us well, great Hercules. We should dishonour him, and the expectation of Greece hath of us, delude by this delay. Then let us <sighs> from this harbour launch our Argo, to Colchis first, and in our voyage home, revenge us on this false low maiden. You sway me, princes. Farewell! treacherous king. Naught save thy blood shall satisfy this wrong and base dishonour done to Hercules, except me. For by Olympic love I swear, ne'er to set foot within my native Thebes, see Deonera, or to touch in Greece till I have scaled these muirs, invaded Troy, ransacked thy city, slain Laomedon, and venge the gods that govern sea and sun. Come, valiant heroes, first the fleece to enjoy, and in our back return to ransack Troy. And they exit. We dread you not, we'll answer what is done, as well as stand against Neptune and the sun. And that is the end of uh, Act Three, Scene One. Oh dear. It's, yeah, they never learn these people, do they? <laughs> oath breakers. Uh, yeah, yeah. It never goes well, breaking your oath. Uh, before we get into it, though, I just wanted to say uh, rounds of applause to Rachel, who ended up playing um, her, her, her own father there uh, and did brilliant, brilliantly well with the silly voices at short notice. So thank you for that. Um, right. OK. Who wants to have a crack at this then? Alan. One thing that isn't so important with the voice version, but if, if anybody ever attempted to stage this, which I think possibly unlikely, um, is that needs to be some clarification because there are a number of occasions where the stage directions are talking about groups of people, the Argonauts, the Greeks, the Trojans, and it does need some keying to so that we know which team is which, as it were, mm. um, because it's not self-evident to those of us who are not as well versed in the classical myths as maybe we should be. 
Mm, I mean, it, it was talking in the stage directions at one point as the, what was it, the, the, the Trojans up above and the Greeks down below, or yeah. vice versa. So I assume there was there's some sort of, yes. But I, I think there's a, a almost total overlap between the Argonauts and the Greeks, but mm, yes. it, it, it just needs a bit of clarification. Mm. Mm. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, because um, was it last week that we were doing that um, mask of the the marriage mask with Ben Johnson or the week before the he, the, the the costuming detail that they talk about in the masks that mm. maybe that could be portrayed um, the, that clarification could come partially through costume. Mm. Um, yes. or, th or through casting, you know, because Castor and Pollux are twin brothers, mm. even if they're half twin brothers, that, you know, the, also in the staging subtly, you know, by putting those two people closer and, you know, also seeing, you know, whatever their myth is associated with, whatever symbol was associated with their myth or um, two actors that look similar or, you know, slightly different, but closer than the rest of the group, or um, I, 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 I really don't know. <laughs> I'd have to go more into the myths to like, you know, the trinkets mm. that Heracles might be carrying around or something. Mm. Yeah, I think it would be, uh, I, I think it would be easy enough to um, distinguish between the the Argonauts and the, and the Trojans with, yeah, through costume. I mean, they, they might all be wearing a, a symbol of the, of the Argonaut. Um, you know, so yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't be that difficult uh, if it was on stage. Audio would be a different matter, but I'm sure there would be ways to overcome it. Yeah, um, um, Helen. Uh, Hercules obviously is is he's got a, a, a lion skin and a club. I mean, everybody oh. knows him. The problem with poor old Hercules is that half of us keep on thinking he's called. He's, he's using his Greek name of Heracles, but the text keeps calling him Alcides. Yes. Which is a real pain because it's nowhere clear to anybody but that these, that Hercules is Heracles, is Alcides. Mm. Um, yeah, it, I mean, yes, it kind of becomes evident in the text, doesn't it? And I suppose Haywood was assuming that his audience would know um, but for a modern audience, yeah, it might be. Every time he calls himself Alcides, mm. he needs to pump his chest. Yes, yes. To indicate it's me it's I'm me. talking about. It's me, you know? me, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, good, good point. Um, well, right, okay. And uh, any any thoughts about the, the character construction, the way this is building up? I mean, it's been quite uh, this whole play so far. I mean, because it's episodic. All the episodes have been fairly action-packed. Elizabeth? I just thought Laomedon Lam, Lam, was incredibly brave, you know, because he stands up against all these Argonauts and he's like, no, no, I can, I can, um, what's his last line? Um, Would we dread you not? We'll answer what is done, as well as stand against Neptune and the sun. I just thought Laomedon came across as a very, very powerful character in that scene. Yes, I, either very brave or very stupid. Well, very stupid. Yeah, I mean, his, 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 class, his last line, as well as stand against Neptune and the sun, when they've literally just saved his daughter from Neptune's curse. It's like, what? Because that worked out really well last time. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but but yes, being being very kingly, um, breaking his word and then and then sticking to breaking his word. It's so, it's lovely seeing all the all all the uh the the, the 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 youngsters and knowing what's going to happen yes because yes. i'm sure that the a fair proportion of the intended audience mm. knew who priam was yeah and i'm sure that they knew who aeneas was mm. Mm. yeah yeah, Prime um, especially. I mean, yes. here he is, all all young. Well, and yeah, optimistic. but they, they probably they probably seen Dido. Mm. Yeah, true. Yes, because I mean, this is sixteen thirteen, isn't it? So yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Yeah, this is the uh, what do they call it? The origin story. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Right, okay. Shall we move on then into uh, Act 3, Scene 2 and see what occurs next. So here we have Enter uh, Etis, King of Colchis, Medea, Young Abstertus with Lords. How may we glory above other kings, being by our birth descended from the gods? Our wealth renowned through the world tripartite, most in the riches of the golden fleece, and not the least of our, all our happiness. Medea, for her powerful magic skill and negromantic exorcisms, admired and dreaded through the Colchian territories. I can by art make rivers retrograde, alter their channels, run back to their heads, and hide them in the springs from whence they grew. The curled ocean with a word all smooth, or being calm, raise waves as high as hills, threatening to swallow the vast continent. With powerful charms, I'll make the sun stand still, or call the moon down from her arched sphere. What can I not? What cannot I by power of Hecate? Discourse, fair sister, how the golden fleece came first to Colchos. Let Absyrtus know. Prixus, the son of Theban Athanus, and his fair sister Hellas, being betrayed by their cursed stepdame. Eno fled from Greece. Their Eno sends, pitied by Mercury, he gave to them a golden fleeced ram, which bore them safe to the Sigean Sea, which swimming beauteous Hellas there was drowned, and gave that sea the name of Hellespont, that which part Cestus and Abydos still. Prixus, Prixus arrives at Colchos and to Mars, there sacrificed his ram in memory of his safe waftage, favored by the gods. The golden fleece was by the oracle commanded to be fixed there, kept and guarded by two fierce bulls that, breath infer that breathe infernal fires and by a wakeful dragon in whose eyes never came sleep. For in the safe conserving of this divine and worthy monument, our kingdom's wheel in safety most consists. And he that strives by purchase of this fleece to weaken us or shake our royalty must taste the fury of these fiery fiends. A shout, enter a lord. The nobles speak. Ah, upon the Colchian shores, a stately vessel. Manned, it seems, from Greece, is newly launched, full fraught with gentlemen of brave aspects and presence. Who's their general? Jason. He styles himself a prince of Greece and captain of the noble Argonauts. Usher them in that we may know their quest and what adventure drew them to these shores. Sound. Enter Jason, Hercules, Theseus, Castor, Pollux, etc. Hail, King of Colchis, thou beholdst in us the noblest heroes that inhabit Greece, of whom I, though unworthiest, style myself the general. The intent of this our voyage is to reduce the rich and golden prize to Greece, from whence it came. Know I am come to tug and wrestle with the infernal bulls, and in their hot fires double gild my arms, to place upon their necks the servile yoke and bondage, force them plough the field of Mars, till in the furrows I have sowed the teeth of vipers, from which men in armour grow to enter combat with the sleepless dragon and maugre him fetch thence the golden fleece. And all this, Aetes, I am pressed to achieve against these horrid tasks my life to engage bull's fury Viper's poison, dragon's rage. Such a bold spirit and noble presence light linked, never before were seen in Phasis Isle. Colchus be proud, a prince demands thy fleece, richer than that he comes for. Let the Greeks, our 
Phasian wealth and Aetes treasure bear. So they in lieu will leave me, Jason, here. Princes, you aim at dangers more in proof than in report, which if you should behold their tr in their true figure would amaze your spirits. Yea, terrify the gods. Let me advise you as one that knows their terror to desist and ere you enwrap yourself into these perils whence there is no evasion. It is no perils a babe. The greater dangers threaten. The greater is his honor that breaks through. Have we in the Argo rowed with sixty oars, and at each oar a prince, pierced Samothrace, the Cheris Ness on sea, the Hellespont, even to the waves that break on culture's shores? And shall we, with dishonor, turn to Greece? No, Aetes, not the least of sixty heroes that now are in thy confines but thy monsters dare quell and baffle. Much more Hercules. Hercules. Starts Oetes at the name of Hercules? What would he do to see him in his eminence? But leaving that, this must be Jason's quest, a work not worthy him. Where be these monsters? May all enchantments be confined to hell, rather than he encounter fiends so fell. Uh, princes, since you will needs attempt these dangers, you shall, and if achieve the golden fleece, transport it where you please. Meantime, this day repose yourselves. We'll feast you in our palace. Tomorrow morning, with the rising sun, our golden prize shall be conserved or won. And he exits. If he attempts, he dies. What's that to me? Why should Medea fear a stranger's life? But what's that Jason I should dread his fall? If he overcomes, my father glory wane, my father's glory wanes, and all our fortunes must reward his pains. Let Jason perish then, and Colchos flourish. Our pristine glories let us still enjoy, and these are brass head bulls the prince destroy. Oh, what distractions this within me bred? Although he die, I would not see him dead. The best I see, the worst I follow still. He ne'er wronged me. Why should I wish him ill? Shall the bulls toss him whom Medea loves? A tigress, not a princess, should I prove, to see him tortured whom I dearly love? Be then a torturess to thy father's life, a robber of the clime where thou wast bred. And for some straggler that hath lost his way, Thy father's kingdom and his state betray. Tush, these are nothing. First his faith I'll crave. That covenant made him by enchantment save. And um, we'll just take a moment to pause there. So, uh, another day, another kingdom, another quest, another princess. Thoughts. How did you find uh, how did you find reading uh, Medea, Rachel? What do we think of her so far? Um, I, I don't know. There's the, the way that this uh, play uh, has portrayed the women in this um, so far. It seems like I don't know, like Atlanta yesterday was very tough, but there was that, you know, virginizing her and, uh, you know, making a point that she's not, you know, a salacious person, a lascivious person or whatever. But that seems to be how uh, Medea is being painted. Like, you know, the, I, I, I don't know how to say it, like describe it. Is this I don't know, is this, would this be falling towards the end of Elizabeth's reign or is falling under James with his yeah. witch obsession? Because it seems like some of that, we're getting some of that witch stuff again, the mm. way that they seem to be described. Yeah, we had a mention of Hecate as well, didn't we? Um, yeah, this is this is James, uh, I, I believe. Helen is the yeah. historian in this group, but um, we're into James by now. 
Yes, we're into James. James was not quite as witch obsessed, we now believe. He, he, he was very good at exposing fake witches, as well as um, believing in one or two true Scottish ones. So, <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, I'm talking about some actual Scottish witch trials. Where were you, Helen, when we needed you? When we... <laughs> <laughs> we were doing all those witchy plays. Um, I, I was, I, 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 I was, I was engaged, heavily engaged in another project. Oh. Sorry about that. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. We can have that talk another time. Uh, anyone else got anything else to add? Rachel, do carry on. I, I also wanted to say that um, the this, uh, I don't know, the ladies in this play and Medea, um seemed different from the ladies from the other plays that we were doing because there was some it did feel like there was some different psychology going on in the first other ones and this is like a sequel that's much more action-packed and not as um psychological because like i remember for the golden age we were like talking about you know zeus was coming off like a sort of serial criminal like um like psychology and it was like uh watching one of those you know, crime shows almost. Um, and and uh, certain scenes, it seemed like there was real genuine love and romance between people, but this is not as much about the people or the characters. I really feel it's just about um, that action or the staging, like Alan said yesterday, mm. the costumes or the bomb bombast, you know, all that. Yeah. And the sort of inexorable plot, uh, this this kind of carrying us through doesn't. It's, it's almost like it doesn't seem to matter who who it is. It's just this is the this is the plot. These are the myths. Um, Eric. Yeah, and what I find interesting in this is that um, it, it like sort of Medea's like change of mind mm. happens within one line. <laughs> <laughs> literally uh she goes and these you know she she's talking about how jason's kind of you know why should i care i mean i don't even know the guy um and he's if he gets the golden fleece everything is going to come you know come crumbling down um and then she goes what distractions this within me bread although he die I, I would not see him dead and then you know she launches yeah. into how much she loves him <laughs> which is quite a change uh, and impressively big change i mean yes pivot and, yeah yes it's it's quite it's quite strong uh elizabeth i just have to say that i'm missing venus here yeah. i know adonis is no longer with us but i am missing venus and her kind of interludes of her like love love making and 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 sort of that kind of almost feminine touch i think it's becoming like a sausage fest <laughs> it's becoming it's all this and I think Brandy might say willy waving yes. there's a lot of like I am stronger no I am stronger no I will solve I will be the hero no I'll be the hero and there's a lot of heroes around and they're all men like at least before we in the last few scenes we had we had Atlanta and mm. she's the one who struck the boar first which was quite cool and then she became the queen um but now we just kind of having just a very masculine, very, uh, yeah, that's how I would describe it. We're having like a very masculine narrative and it's just kind of dense. The language is very, very dense as well to go with that. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, uh, oh, uh, oh, right, Eric, qu quickly, we need to press on. Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say that uh, in addition to that, uh, Medea has to choose between personal love, uh, you know, sort of romance and, um, you know, um, it's called national security, whatever you want to call it, sort of being faithful to the crown, that kind of thing, and being faithful to herself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, Helen, quickly. You're muted. Um. What I, what really annoyed me about this scene was the the sense of entitlement that the Argonauts have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here <laughs> is another country with a national treasure, 
Yeah. And Jason and the Argonauts roll up and says, yeah, we'll have that. Um, <laughs> and I mean, there's no God sent us a vision that it was really ours. I mean, there's no, there's no excuse. They're not saying it's reparations. They're not saying I'm the long lost heir of the country. It's really mine. There's nothing, absolutely what? nothing. Well, he does say, to be fair, he does say, oh, you know, Hellas, it was Hellas's originally, so we've come to get it. But it's, it's oh, very, it's why, very... Sorry, I missed that it's, bit. It's, 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 very, it's very quick. And uh, it's... Uh, reading yeah, this I, as, I take it back. He, he was obviously completely entitled. It was a bit flimsy, yeah. though, to, to be fair. And it, it's quite interesting reading this uh, now as a modern reader, <laughs> you know, it's that it's the Greeks going... <laughs> wanting to to do some cultural appropriation because of course in modern day life it's <laughs> the greeks are always very much on the other end of that um uh, equation uh right we must move on um but i wanted to just go back to what elizabeth said about uh venus because uh yesterday we had these sort of intense periods of uh action uh and then we had the uh, interlude with venus uh, and Adonis in the middle, and then more action, action, action. Today we started with lots of action, and we're now going to go into uh, Jason and Medea. So we'll see if perhaps uh, we we that actually changes the tone um, of the play slightly. Let's find out. Enter Jason. My task is above strength. Duke Peleus sent me not to achieve, but die in this pursuit, and to prevent the oracle that told him I must succeed. Jason, bethink thee then. Is this my line? I'm talking about myself? I think so. Yep. I, I yep. think so, yes. Okay. Yes, you're okay. addressing yourself. Yes. I address myself. Jason, bethink thee then. Thou comest to execution, not to act things above man. I have observed Medea retort upon me many an amorous look, of which I'll study to make prosperous use if by her art the enchantment I can bind, immured with death, I certain safety find. Shall I overwhelm upon my captive head the curse of all our nation, the crown's ruin? Clamors of men and women's loud exclam exclaims, burnings of children, the universal curse of a great people, all to save one man, a straggler, God knows whence derived, where born or hither, where noble, but the proud Greek die. We still in Colco sit in stated high. Oh me, that look upon Medea cast drowns all these fears and hath the rest surpassed. Madam, because I love, I pity you, that you a beauteous lady, artful wise, should have your beauty and your wisdom both enveloped in a cloud of barbarism, that on these barren confines you should live, confined into an angle of the world, and ne'er see that which is the world indeed, fertile and populous Greece, Greece that bears men such as resemble gods, of which in us you see the most dejected and the meanest. How harshly doth your wisdom sound in theirs of these barbarians, dull, unapprehensible, and such, in not conceiving your hid arts, deprive them of their honour. In Greece springs the fountains of divine philosophy, they are all understanders. I would have you, bright lady, with us, enter to that world of which this Colchos is no part at all. Shew then your beauty to these judging eyes, your wisdom to these understanding ears, in which they shall receive their merited grace and leave this barren, cold and sterile place. His presence without all this oratory, his presence without all this oratory did much with us, but where they both conjoin to entrap Medea, she must needs be caught. I long to see this Colchian lady clad in Hymen's stateliest robes, whom the glad matrons, bright ladies, and imperial queens of grace shall welcome and applaud, and with rich gifts present, for saving of their sons and kinsmen from these infernal monsters. As for Jason, if you, Medea, shall despise his love, he craves no other life than to die so. 
since life without you is but torturing pain and death to men distressed is double gain. That tongue more than Medea's spells and chants, and not a word, but like our exorcisms and power of charms prevails. Oh, love, thy majesty is greater than the triple Hecates, bewitching Circes, or these hidden skills ascribed unto the infernal Proserpine. I that by incantations can remove hills from their sights and make huge mountains shake darken the sun at noon, call from their graves, ghosts long since dead that can command the earth and affright heaven, no spell at all can find to bondage love or free a captive mind. Love Jason then, and by thy divine aid, give me such power that I may tug unscorched amidst the flames with these thy fiery fiends that I unvenomed may these vipers' teeth cast from my hand through Morpheus's leaden charms over that wakeful snake that guards the fleece for which live Jason's happy bride in Greece. A match, what herbs or spells, what magic can command in heaven, earth, or in hell below, what either air or sea can minister to guard thy person, all these helps I'll gather to girdle thee with safety. Be thou then forever Jason's, and through Greece renowned, in with whom our heroes have such safety found, our bargain thus I seal. He kisseth her. Which I'll make good with Colco's fall and with my father's blood. Enter Absyrtus. Prince Jason. All the heroes at the banquet inquire for you. Twice hath my father Aetes made search for you. Oh, sister! No word you saw us to in conference. Do you take me to be a woman to tell all I see and blab all I know? I that am hope one day to lie with a woman will once lie for a woman? Sister, I saw you not. Remember. Come, Prince, will you lead the way? I have parted you that never parted fray. Come, sir, will you follow? And they both exit, leaving Medea alone. The night grows on, and now to my black arts, goddess of witchcraft and dark ceremony, to whom the elves of hills, of brooks, of groves, of standing lakes and caverns vaulted deep are ministers. Three-headed Hecate, let, lend me thy chariot drawn with winged snakes. For I this night mo must progress through the air. What simples grow in temple in temp of Thessaly, Mount Pindus, Authoris, Ossa, Apidane, Olympus, Calcas or high Tenerife, I must select to finish this great work. Thence must I fly unto Amphrysus fords and gather plants by the swift Sperchius streams where rushy Bebes and Anthedon flow, where herbs of bitter juice and strong scent grow. These must I with the hairs of mandrakes use, temper with poppy seeds and hemlock juice, with on, with oconitum that in tartar springs, with cypress yew and vervin, and these mix with incantations, spells, and exorcisms of wondrous power and virtue. O oh, thou night, mother of dark arts, hide me in thy veil, whilst I those banks search and these mountains scale. And uh, we're shortly going to have the entry of the king, but before we do, we'll just pause there for a moment. Wow, we're back to we're back to last week's witching, aren't we? Amazing, Eric, and then Alan. Uh, 
No, yeah, I'm just gesturing because, like, sort of, I, I, I'm too familiar with the myth and the play. Uh, I mean, the the Euripides play, and it's like, yeah, yeah no. Um, but it, it is interesting how this is basically the backstory to the Euripides play, mm-hmm. and it's so interesting that it's Jason using love as like manipulating her into basically loving him and, and giving him sort of help. <laughs> and promising the world and of course yeah. Uh, we well yeah anyway <laughs> i don't we, know if i should spoil it for people well, who don't know we, we 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 all know where how that's gonna go i i <laughs> I, I, I i'm guessing you're fairly safe with the spoilers there who, who who knows maybe maybe this is an alternative uh, universe maybe maybe it'll all be fine um i alan i saw your hand yeah i mean it, it struck me that much of that scene between uh jason and medea were almost monologues that occasionally intersected. Mm. There's an awful lot of it, which which has the characteristics, I think, of soliloquy. And then a, occasional bits where they, they do actually genuinely interact. But I, I think you could actually play it as two people, one downstage left, one downstage right, almost musing to themselves, and then occasional lines which get picked up. It was certainly a lot more detached than the scene between mm. Venus and Adonis yesterday, wasn't it? Interesting. Rachel? Um, was it before that we were talking about Laomedon and there were the walls and then the Greeks were below? Mm. Uh, maybe this uh, is the same. They're using the same set, you know, the same set pieces and she's slightly elevated and he's done something like come up below the window and they're reusing it in that way. And so he's saying things and she can hear him. And a lot of her stuff is a side that she's telling to the audience um, or to her or speaking to herself. So, um, you know, and also the structure of this, like how uh, Alan's saying that there's, you know, slight interaction between them that, um, you know, neither of them are fully sincere in what they want to do. Mm. Like the so much of what he's promising, you know, that she could travel, um, that she'd be, you know, have fame or renown. There are all these like things that I think for a woman, you know, of that era is not something that you get to do that is more a masculine thing. Like it's, mm. you know, these Atlanta's gone on the hunt with these guys, but she hasn't gone on the great sailing voyage. Um, you know, that's something that, um, is is owned by men you know in the in the space of the time so there's a uh, freedom that's being offered there and also the freedom of being a married woman of having a certain status too mm-hmm. i think there's uh, a, lo- a a lot of that at at play uh, uh along with like physical lust mm-hmm. so i don't um so i think they might be both playing for love to gain power to gain some sort of power. Mm, yes, although I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, she, she, she yes, she has things uh, that 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 she wants from him, other than just yeah, other than just the sheer physical attraction. But he he does know, as Eric alluded to, he does know how to which buttons to press, doesn't he? Um, and he and he's and he's pressing all of them, uh, without any any qualms. Uh, right, shall we continue? Uh, there is a sound, an enter, King uh, Aetis, uh, Absyrtus, and Lords. On the safeguard of this golden fleece, Cocos depends, and he that bears it hence bears with it all our fortunes. The Argonauts have it in quest. If Jason escape our monsters, I'll, I'll rather at some banquet poison him and quaff to him his death, or in the night set fire upon his Argo and in flames consume the happy hope of his return this purpose we as we are Colchus king where's your sister in her chamber when you next see her give to her this note the manner of our practice her fell hand cannot be missed in this but it shall fall heavily on these that Colchus seeks to thrall the hour draws nigh the people throng on th- on heaps to this adventure in the field of Mars and noble Jason armed with his good shield is up already and demands the field. 
Enter Jason, Hercules, and the Argonauts. Aetes, I come thus armed, demanding combat of all those monsters that defend thy fleece. And to these dangers singly I oppose my person as thou seest. When settest thou ope the gates, ope the gates of hell to let thy devils out. Glad would I wrestle with thy fiery bulls, and from their throats the flaming dewlaps tear. Unchain them, and to Jason turn them loose, that as Alcides did to Achilles, so from their hard fronts I may tear their horns, and lay the yoke upon their untamed necks. Did valiant Greek desist, I, though a stranger, pity thy youth, or... If thou wilt persist, so dreadful is the adventure thou pursuest that thou wilt think I shall unbowl hell, unmanacle the fiends, and make a passage free for the infernals. I shall welcome all. Medea now, if there be power in love or force in magic, if thou hast or will or art, try all the power of characters, virtue of simples, stones, or hidden spells. If earth elves or nimble airy spirits, charms, incantations, or dark exorcisms, if any strength remain in pyromancy, or the hid secrets of the air on or fire, if the moon's sphere can ha any help infuse, or any influence star, collect them all, that I by thy aid made these monsters draw. Discover them. Two fiery bulls are discovered, the fleece hanging over them, and the dragon sleeping beneath them. Medea, with strange fiery works, hangs above in the air in a strange habit of a conjurus. The hidden power of earth, air, water, fire, shall from this place to Jason's help conspire. Fire withstand fire, and magic temper fire by my strong spells the savage monsters tame so that's performed now take the viper's teeth and sow them in the furrowed field of mars of which strange seed men ready armed must grow to assault jason already from beneath their deadly pointed weapons gin to appear and now their heads thus moulded in the earth, straightway shall teem and have freed their fate. The stalks by which they grow all violently pursue the valiant Greek, but by my sorcery all turn their armed points, ag points against themselves and all these slaves that would on Jason fly. Somebody shouts. Shall wound themselves and by sedition die. Yet thrives the Greek. Now kill the sleeping snake, which I have charmed, and thence the trophy take. These shouts witness his conquest. I'll descend. Hear Jason's fears and all my charms. Take end. And Hercules? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Aetes, now is this rich and precious fleece by Jason's sword repurchased and must turn unto the place whence Phrixus brought his ram. That practice by your ruins, I'll prevent and sooner than would that return to Greece, your slaughtered bodies leave with this rich fleece. Since our adventure is achieved and done, the prize is ours, we seize what we have won. Enjoy it, Jason. I admire thy worth, which, as it hath exceeded admiration, so we must needs applaud it. Noble gentlemen, depart not, Colchos. Ere your worth and valour we with some rich and worthy gifts present. The conquest of our bulls and dragons' death, though we esteem them, but they sad us not, since we behold the safety of this prince. Enter our palace, and your praise shall sound high, where you shall feast, or by old treason die. And he exits not seen my sister today. I muse she hath not been at this solemnity. He thinks she should have not have lost her this triumph. I have a note to deliver her from my father. Here she comes. 
Enter Medea. Sister, peruse this brief. You know the character. It is my father's. This is all. He exits, she reads. Jason with his Argonauts this night must perish. The fleece not be transported to Greece. Medea, your assistance. This is my father's plot to overthrow. Prince Jason and the noble Argonauts. Which I'll prevent. I know the king is sudden, and if prevention be delayed, they die. I, that have ventured thus far for a love, even to these arts that nature would have hid, as dangerous and forbidden, shall I now undo what I have done, through womanish fear, paternal duty, or for filial love? No, Jason, thou art mine, and my desire shall wade with thee through blood, through seas, through fire. Enter Jason. Madam. My lord, I know what you would say. Think now upon your life. The king, my father, intends your ruin to redeem the fleece, and it repurchase with your tragic deaths. Therefore, assemble all your Argonauts and let them, in the silence of the night, launch from the Colchian harbor. I'll associate you as Jason's bride. You are my patroness and under you I triumph. When the least of all these graces I forget, the gods revenge on me my hated perjury. Must we then launch this night? You are my directress, and by your art I'll manage all my actions. Then fly, I'll send to see your Argo trimmed, rigged and made tight. Night comes, the time grows on. Hi then aboard. I shall. And he exits. Now, populous Greece, thank us, not Jason, for this conquered fleece. Enter Itis. Medea, we are robbed, despoiled, dishonored, our, our fleece wrapped hence. We must not suffer it since all our ominous fortunes it includes. I am resolved this tonight. I am resolved Jason this night shall die. Should he survive, you might be held unworthy the name of king. My hand shall be as deep as yours in his destruction. A strong guard I will select, and in the dark, dead of night, when they are sunk in leafy, set upon them and kill them in their beds. I'll second you and lathe, and lathe my stained hands in their reeking bloods that practice your dishonor. Jason then dies when he most hopes for this rich Colchian prize. And he exits. But ere the least, but ere the least, but ere the least of all these isle ills betide, this Colchian strawn shall with thy blood be dyed. For Jason and his Argonauts I stand, and will protect them with my art and hand. Enter Jason with the fleece and all the Greeks muffled. Madame Medea. Leave circumstance away. Hoist up your sails. Death and destruction attends you on the shore. You'll follow, madame. Exit. Instantly. Blow gentle gales. Assist them winds and tide. That I may grease see and live Jason's bride. Enter Absitus. How now, sister? So solitary? Oh, happy met, though it be late, absurdus, absurdus, you must along with me. With a pray. I'll tell you as we walk. This lad between me and all harm shall stand. And if the king pursue us with his fleet, his mangled limbs shall, scattered in the way, work our escape. In the king's speed delay. Come, brother. Anywhere with you, sister. And they exit, and that is the end of Act Three. Hmm. I wasn't expecting uh, the end of the act to come quite there, but it did. So there we go. Uh, uh, thoughts from the room about that last scene, Elizabeth. I really like Medea's sense of agency in this. Um, I was like hungering when we did the last talk with the last um, discussion I was really hungering for a female character to kind of step 
forward and kind of take charge and do something heroic. And I really like Medea's agency here. I, I like that she's like driving the narrative and she's driving the plot forward. Mm. Yeah, and she has some fantastic speeches, uh, doesn't she? Uh, one of which uh, somebody put in the chat they thought was probably accompanied by a dumb show. Mm. Uh, which, uh, Rachel. The, when she is suspended in the air, I mm. think they are below and it's like, um, the one we did yesterday uh, where uh, Homer, I think it was Homer was probably on the side mm. and then he was describing the dumb show as it happened. She's above, she's describing this dumb show. Uh, the one with the dragon uh, that you said and all those things. And as uh, that dumb show is happening, she's above, you know, and there's the, she's guiding the action and giving them um, direction to the action or you know, just describing it to the audience. Mm. Yeah, it's quite a spectacle. Uh, Alan? Yeah, I mean, I, I must admit, I was looking at that and thinking, hold on a minute, didn't Harryhausen do a job on that? You know, the sewing of the viper's teeth and so on. Um, the more I see and hear of this play, the more it seems to me that the words are there really just to provide some continuity between um, highly elaborately staged and costumed uh, dumb shows, mm. Mm. you know, and, and I, I think that this was, could almost have been a non-verbal show, which has got enough text just to, pro to provide cover for some of the gaps. I don't know, there's quite a lot of text. Mm. <laughs> I think if that was his intention, he could have trimmed it slightly. But <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 and I, I think it would actually have benefited from a blue pencil uh, in places. Um, well, uh, yeah, we, we shall see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you in a minute, Eric. But I'm just gonna go. I saw Elizabeth's hand. I'm just gonna go back to Elizabeth, and then I'll come to you, Eric. Yeah, just to second what Alan just said. Um, Rachel mentioned earlier about Hyam and I the mask mm. of the marriage and the unions and stuff and that had that had a lot of speech but none of that speech was important everything was about the spectacle sure. and i kind of see I, I see what alan's point is here because the 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 words are nice and there's a lot of them but the the spectacle especially the the scene of medea as the conjurer coming down from from the rafters that you know that, we're not supposed to really be listening to what they're saying we're supposed to be watching what's happening on stage mm. yeah could 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 be eric uh yeah i, I was just going to i mean i second that but also or third, and the third that i know anyway <laughs> yeah um but um I lost count um but yeah, I also just I, the whole how quickly Medea changes her mode of address. Like, I mean, not just like towards Jason and stuff, but sort of she goes, yeah, come with me, brother. And then you can imagine her like, you know, if, if this were a film, you they would close up on like they, they would be like zoom in on a knife or something, mm. um, you know, that she's holding by his neck or I don't know, whatever behind her. It's just so like, I mean, obviously it's dark material, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, I found that 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 particular the way he ended that act I found really interesting. Um, it seemed quite modern in the way it just suddenly ended. Uh, Rachel, um, I think Absyrtus. Uh, I think he's a clown, you know, because there's the last scene when he comes in with like um, uh, in between Medea and Jason and catches them. He's like, what do you think I am? I'm not going to say anything. Like, it's very, uh, um, it, it's a very funny, uh, unexpected moment, you know, because these are, to, her and Jason are uh, so serious and what they're doing is so, um, uh, you know, they're, they're each manipulating and they're playing this game. And I think they're very into that game. Uh, and it's just a very serious moment. And he completely breaks it by mm -hmm. saying that. Um, yeah, he yeah. does. He could be, he could be, he could be just be very young. He could be that he's a lot younger than I got the impression that he was, you know, maybe, I mean, not, not a, not a child child, but maybe in his uh, mid teens, maybe not fully grown. Uh, Alan and Elizabeth. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm seeing him as the annoying little brother, mm. you know, and 
sister basically has probably clouted him round the ear on many occasions of bugger off you little so and so. Mm. <laughs> don't mm. don't queer me pitch. Mm. While I'm plotting. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth. Yeah, speaking of modern moments that kind of were unexpected, the passing of the note from Medea's father. I thought that was really modern. I was I really wasn't expecting that. And it was kind of like uh, very clandestine, very Bond-esque, you know, like uh, a spy movie. Medea's getting this secret note from her father to tell her what's planned and everything. Um, I just thought that that was a very modern move from Haywood. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's throwing all kinds of different things at us, this play. Right, okay, let's continue. Uh, we're going into act four and I am now going to pass the baton of the play over to Helen, uh, who can take it up. And uh, <laughs> there we go. And uh, and so, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll over to you, Helen. Okay, act four. And as usual, we have the prologue. The enter, prologue. <laughs> enter Homer. Let none to whom true art is not denied our monstrous bulls and magic snakes deride. Some think this rich fleece was a golden book, the leaves of parchment, or the skins of ram, which did include the art of making gold by chimic skill, and therefore rightly styled the golden fleece, which to attain and compass includes as many travels, mysteries, changes, and chimic bodies fires and monsters as ever Jason could in Colpus meet, the sages and the wise to keep their art from being vulgar, yet to have them tasted, with appetite and longing gives those glosses and flourishes to shadow what they write, which might at once breed wonder and delight. So did the Egyptians in the arts best tried in hieroglyphs all their science hide, but to proceed the Argonauts are fled, whom the enraged Aetes did pursue. And being in sight, Medea takes the head of young Absertus, whom, unkind, she slew, and all his other limbs strews in the way of the old father, his pursuit to stay. And here, or hereabouts, there is a dumb show. In memory of this inhumane deed, these islands where his slaughtered limbs lie spread were called absurdities. But we proceed with King Lamedon, against whom are led the Argonauts. Troy, by Alcides raced, asks the next place and must in rank be placed. Enter Laomedon, his son, young Priam, Anchises and his son Aeneas with Hesione and others. The Argonauts returned. They are, my lord. And landed. Landed. Where? At Tenedos. Could not those Colchian monsters in their bowels bury the Greeks? But must they all survive to threaten us with invasion? Speak, Ancides, and at... And Chises, march they towards Troy. In conduct of the mighty Hercules, wasting with sword and fire where'er they march, Scamander fields they have strewed with carcasses, and Simois streams already purpled are with blood of Trojan, Trojans. Let us give them battle. In vain. Our forces are dispersed abroad, nor have we order to withstand their fury. Best were we to immure ourselves in Troy and trust unto the virtue of our walls. There are shouts. Do not delay your safety. You may hear their cries and lofty clamors threatening Troy. They dog us to our gates and without speed and expedition, they will enter with us. Come then. Our threatened lives we will immure and think our, in our strong built walls secure. The Trojans exit and after an alarm enter Hercules, Jason, Theseus, Telamon and all the other Argonauts. 
I'm no longer Hercules, someone else is. Oh, um, I, ooh, ooh, I don't have, let me just have a little quick look. Do we have a second Hercules? Uh, yes, I, Sarah. It's me. I am the second Hercules. That would explain it. Right. My apologies, everybody. Enter everybody. <laughs> Pursue the chase, even to the gates of Troy, then call the great Lamedon to parley. Urged king shall pay us for the wrong done to Alcides in his promised deeds. Better he had the monster had devoured his beauteous daughter than to abide our furies. He did exclude our virtue from the city, and now therefore he shall admit our fury. These walls first reared at the great god's expense will ruin to the earth. Let's summon him. We will call him to parley. A parley is sounded. Enter upon the walls King Laodamon, Anchises, Aeneas, Priam, and the rest. Laomedon, we do not summon thee to parley, but to warn thee, guard thy walls, which without pause we now intend to scale. Wilt hear me, Heracles? I listened thy perjurous tongue too late. Scale, batter, mount, assault, sack, and deface, and leave of Troy naught, save the name and the place. Alarm. Telamon first mounts the walls, the rest after. Priam flies. Laomedon is slain by Hercules. Hesione taken. Re-enter Hercules and the Argonauts with victory. Thus is the tyrant that but late all Troy buried amidst his ruins. He chastised and we revenged. The spoil of this rich town, rated as high as Jason's Colchian prize, you shall divide. But first, these lofty walls, builded by perjury and maintained by pride, will ruin to the earth. Who saw young Priam? He's fled and took the way to Samothrace. With him Anchises that on Venus got, the young Aeneas, they are fled together and left the spoil of all the town to us. Which shall enrich Thebes and the towns of Greece. And Telamon, to do thy valour right for mounting first over the walls of Troy, the first and choice of all the spoil be thine. Then let Alcides honour Telamon with this bright lady, fair Hesione, sister to Priam, daughter to Laomaden, whose beauty I prefer before the state and wealth of Troy. Receive her, Telamon. She is thine own by gift of Hercules. Present more delighting, Telamon, than I were made lord of high Ilium's towers and heir unto the dead Laomaden. I am a princess. Shall my father's ills fall on my head? If he offended Heracles, he hath made satisfaction with his life. Oh, be not so severe to stretch his punishment even after life. Hast thou from death redeemed me to give me captive and to slave my youth? Things worse than death. Rather let Heracles expose me on the rock where first he found me, to abide the wrath both of the sea and sun. <laughs> Rather make my body food for monsters than brand my birth with bondage. Fair Hesione, I will not loose thy beauty, nor thy youth, nor part with this my honour. Couldst thou give me a ransom of them? Both are Argus crammed with gold and gems. You are my valour's prize and shall with me to poplar Salamine. Can you so wrong the daughter of a king to give her as a duke's base concubine? Touch me not, Telamon, for I divine, if e'er my brother Priam rebuild Troy and be the king of Asia, he'll revenge this base <clears throat> dishonor done Hesione, and for his sister ravished hence perforce. Do the like outrage on some Grecian king in just revenge of my injurious wrong. Should all the kings in Asia, all the world, take part with Priam in that proud design, like fate, 
like fortune with Leia made on, they shall abide. Renowned Telamon, she is the warlike purchase of thy sword, and joy her as the gift of Hercules. And now, brave Grecian heroes, let's towards Greece with all these honoured spoils from Colchis brought, and from the treasures of defaced Troy. Fair Deianera longs for us in Thebes, whom we will visit, and thence proceed unto our future labours. Caucus lives, a bloody tyrant, whom we must remove, and the three-headed Geryon sways in Spain, notorious for his rapes and outrages. Both these must perish by Alcides' hand, and when we can the earth from tyrants clear, in the world's utmost bounds our pillars rear. And if I had a bell, I would ring it, but I don't. Let's take a pause and discuss. Ah, uh, yes, a lot of uh, precursoring going on there. Do we have any, any views? Eric? I, I didn't enjoy the bit of like yes he fled to Samothrace with uh with the uh, Anchises who by the way happened to make <laughs> Venus uh, pregnant with Aeneas and it's like this is not really necessary but in case you missed the connection it's going to come up later yeah uh, uh, Sarah um I I I really didn't like Hercules earlier but I I I like him even less now he he is just he is so full of it isn't he <laughs> he just loves himself and it's getting to the point now i mean he was fairly um you know he was fairly macho and swaggering and there was a lot of club waving going on earlier uh and then jason came and outdid him for a bit but it's like it seems maybe because jason came and outdid him for a bit he's he's just got even more <laughs> intense with the machismo to the point where i'm thinking are we actually supposed to be hating him? Because <laughs> I'm assuming he's meant to be heroic, that the audience are meant to be with him. I'm not with him. I'm thinking maybe a lot of modern audience wouldn't be, but I'm now beginning to think, actually, are we supposed to be really like hating him? Because he's just so irritating. But <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure, but I am like, yeah, I am I am very over Her Hercules at this point. Does anyone want to speak for Hercules? Rachel. I actually have no idea like about like to what Sarah just said but like Zeus was the same way in the first two and then Heracles came and I if I remember well he was kind of like this the last time I don't really remember that that well but I have no idea if the audience was supposed to be for or against them but they have this weird way of just continuing to do these horrible things um but i don't know uh I, I think dan like said in one of them that like or somebody said that we shouldn't think that an audience would be for all these things either you know what i mean because like they're they are doing like terrible things i think the most uh annoying part for me is that they're so um hypocritical hypocritical like they've just taken this woman prisoner against her will and uh you know, I think there's some implication of sexual violence to come. And then they're talking about some Garyon uh, guy or some monster in Spain that rapes and outrages, even if rape means to kidnap or something like, it's just the, um, that they don't have any form of self-reflection or self-awareness. Yeah. Uh... Any, 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 Eric? I do like that he has a checklist. It's like, because like, it just kind of, like traditionally, you know, he has to go back to um, his uncle, sort of be told, you know, what the next labor is. But he already knows his labors. Therefore, he's like, and now I will go forth and, uh, you know, sort of, um, I've got shit to do, basically. <laughs> I have a to-do list and it's due tomorrow or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, 
you, someone was saying that he's very like uh, he's very like Zeus, but of course that's like father like son. Mm. I mean, he is the son of Zeus, so obviously there's a certain amount of. Um, he's a demigod. He's 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 half man, half god. Uh, but uh, any more? I mean, on an editor from an editorial note, I think the beginning of the act has been put in the wrong place. I have a feeling that Act Four ought to start here, because we've got Homer coming back on again. And I think it would make a bit more sense. That would make a lot more sense, actually, because mm. I, I, I was really surprised by where it ended. And I actually quite liked the way it, where it ended, but this, yeah, that, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you, apart from where it's just a, uh, where we did put the um, beginning of Act Four, uh, that is the only play. Apart from that, Homer only appears at the beginning of each act, so it, it is a little confusing. Um, you know, see Homer put in act change, Alan. I'm just wondering, in fact, whether this started as a six actor. And what's happened is that that was a very short act. Are six actors a thing? We've had one or two of them. Have we? Oh. Because uh, it scared the hell out of me when I was doing one of the, the looks at the casting lists and suddenly we had six acts and I thought, WGF's going on here. Mm -hmm. Um so it may be that there was actually another break. As you say, Homer opens each act. Um, and to a certain extent, what we just had was a unit of action because you've got, you've got away from Coltis and then you've got the, the sacking of Troy or a sacking of Troy, which as we know from real history, I mean, I think Troy... I think Schliemann counted up to 13 yeah, Tro the, Trojan settlements. Yeah, and the Trojan War one that we know of is something like it, Troy 7. Yeah, and which, which uh, Schliemann dug straight through and found stuff from two or three layers previously. Yeah. Um, but it, it feels to me almost like what we've done there was an act in itself. Hmm. Mm. I felt that poor old younger brother uh, was, there could have been a moment when he said things like, oh, sister, do not hurt me or something. You know, I mean, it would have been nice to have seen his story arc completed. No, I, I, I think he, he fulfilled his role. He was the interfering brat and he... To a certain no, no, extent, no. got what he deserved. Sweet lad, sweet lad, that <laughs> should never have been torn apart. Elizabeth. Oh, I just really um, enjoyed listening to the comments that have been made about this scene because it's something, something awkward about the last few scenes of this new act, and about like, um, I think Sarah called it pontificating last time, and I would call it proselytizing. I think that might be another word for it. With, with Hercules' unlikability, which is really unusual because in in our, a lot of our texts in modern um, and modern in the modern day, he's like a Superman. He's like this like hero that's all about goodness. But in this one, in this text, he seems to be all about himself. He seems to be self-absorbed. I just wondered if anyone else thought that thought the same. Rachel. To what Elizabeth said, um, the like obsessed with himself and the like, uh, there's so much that I like, even with Jason in the last uh, scene or the couple of them um, that, you know, he's talking to her about things and it's like, he's almost promising her fame um, too. And like the, uh, that idea that we have of fame as a different thing now than it was then. And it's like uh, Heracles is very much about, you know, the masculinity and his own personal fame and his own personal 
honor. So I do wonder how people would look at that, you know, or if they would look at that in a certain um, different light. Um, yeah, I think we probably ought to push on unless anyone has anything urgent to contribute. Are we okay? Right, well, wherever we are at the beginning of an act or in the middle of an act, Homer appears again. Loath the we, courteous orders, decloy your appetites with viands of one taste. The beauteous Venus we must next employ, and we saw mourning for Adonis last. Suppose her still for the young Adam sad, but cheered by Mars, their old loves they renew, and she, that whilst he lived, preferred the lad, hath quite forgot him since the boar him slew. Mars is in grace, a meeting they devise, jealous of all, but fearing most the sun. He that sees all things from his first uprise, and like a blab, tells all that he knows done. Our mortals must a while their spleens assuage, and to the gods, for this act, leaves the stage. And Homer also, one has to assume, leaves the stage. Enter Mars and Venus. I knew love's queen could not be long unkind, though while I absent to teach arms in Thrace, you took the advantage to forget your Mars, to dote on Adon and Anchises too. Yet those worn out, let us renew our loves and practice our first amorous dalliance. How can I hate that I that am the queen of love, or practice aught against my native power? As I one day played with my Cupid's shafts, the wanton with his arrow raised my skin. Trust me, at first I did neglect, neglect the smart. At length it rankled and it grew unsound till he that now lies wounded cured my wound. Come, shall we now, well, Vulcan plies his forge, sweats at his anvil, chokes himself with dust and labours at his bellows, kiss and toy? Why met we else? Here is a place remote, an obscure cave fit for our amorous sport. In this dark cavern will securely rest and Mars shall add unto my Vulcan's crest. But how if we be spied? Whom need we fear? Unless the sun, who now the lower world lights with his beams. I mean the Antipodes. The telltale blab is busy now elsewhere. And I will set to watch at the cave's door my trusty groom, who, ere the sun shall rise with his bright beams to light our hemisphere, shall waken us. For all the world I would not have the sun discover our sweet spot or see what's done. Be that my charge. Where's Gallus? And enter Gallus. And answer, I'm not that Gallus that is made of three trees or one that is never without hangers on, or nor that Gallus that is Latin for a Frenchman, but your own Gallus Galinatius, servant and true squire to God Mars. Sarah, you know this lady? Uh, yes, Mistress Vulcan. Uh, she's very well known in Paphos here for her meretrix as any lady in the land. Uh, she was the first that devised you'd meet and proclaimed pickle oysters to be good for the back. She is the first that taught wenches the trade of venery and as such were born to nothing but beauty. She taught them how to use their talent. Yes, I know her, I warrant you. Uh, Sarah, attend. This night... You, Queen, and I must have some private conference in yon cave, where, whilst we stay, it must be thy care to watch that no suspicious eye pry through these chinks, especially, I warn thee, of the suns. I smell knavery. If my lady Venus play the horn, what am I that keep the door? See thou do call us ere the sun uprise, but sleep not, for by all my arms, I swear, if by thy careless sloth or negligence we be described, thy body I'll translate to some strange monster. Hmm? I'm hard favoured enough already. You need not make my face worse than it is. Come, enter then, fair queen. We are secure. 
Now safely mayst thou clasp the god of war, spite of sun, moon, or jealous star. Love answers love, desire with ardor meets, both which this night shall taste a thousand sweets. And the gods enter the cave. I see, you can make a shift to go to it without sheets. How shall I pass this night away till morning? I am as drowsy as a dormouse. The very thought that I must wake charms me asleep already. I would durst venture on a nap. Hey ho, I am sure I may wake again before they rise and never the wiser. I will stand to it. There is not a more sleepy trade in the world than a watchman, nor one that is more acquainted with deeds of darkness. Tell me of the sun. <laughs> The sun will not rise this two hours. Oh, let them watch that will, or can. I must have a nod or two. Good night to you all, for here I am fast till morning. And Gallus falls asleep, and Aurora, goddess of the dawn, enters, attended with seasons, days, and hours. Day star shines and calls me blushing up. From Tithian's bed to harness Phoebus' steeds, my roseate fingers have already stroked the element where light begins to appear, and straight Apollo with his glistering beams will gild the east. The seasons, months and days attend him in the palace of the sun. The hours have brought his chariot to the gate of crystal, where the sun god mounts his throne. His fiery steeds have all their traces set, the unruly stallions fed with ambrosie, with their round hooves shod with the purest gold, thunder against the marble floors of heaven, and wait till Phoebus hath but donned his beams, which I, the blushing morning, still put on. But now's the hour, for thus time fleeteth still, that sun's up to climb the eastern hill. And enter the sun god, Phoebus Apollo, he kisses Aurora, and all but he leave. Beauteous Aurora, for full twice twelve hours till in my sphere I have compassed round the world. Farewell. I with my beams will dry these tears thou shedst at parting. We have chased hence night and frighted all the twinkling stars from heaven. And now the steep Olympus we must climb, till from the high meridian we peruse the spacious bounds of this large universe, and thence decline our chariot towards the west, till we have washed our coach steeds and ourself in Ister's icy streams. We, with this eye, can all things see that mortals do on earth, and what we find inhumane or to offend, we tell to Jove that he may punish sins. For this I am termed a telltale and a blab, and that I nothing can conceal abroad. But let spite spit the worst and wrong me still. Day hateth sins and light despiseth ill. Here Phoebus spies Mars and Venus. And now behold a most abhorred deed. Mars beds with Venus, shall not Vulcan know it? By my light he shall, I have seen and I will tell. The sun hates sin, but crowns them that do well. And Phoebus exits, and that, dear listeners, is your cliff edge hanger, whatever season session break. <laughs> And now we have to find out what later, what will happen to Mars and Venus, because we have to assume that we don't already know. Alan. I mean, one thing that uh, struck me is that the, I don't think we've actually had a clown figure appearing before in any of the previous age plays we've looked at. But Gallus seems definitely to be the clown role that we've seen in many, many other plays. You know, the fact that he's got the word play humour of, um, you know, um, am I a gallows? Am I the Frenchman? Whatever. Uh, is, is, is this the retiring comic doing his 17th farewell tour? 
I, I think there was one, the midwife's servant in the mm. guild plays. I think there was a clown there. But uh, they, they've not been common, have they? No, no, no. I mean, we, we haven't had them, uh, certainly not in this play. Rachel, are you... No, yeah, I was just going to say, I think, wasn't it like the three, um, the three dames or something? Were they? I don't remember. Oh, the was bell it... dams. Yeah, the bell, it was, was it them? Or no? Yes, I... yes dad eyes keepers in the tower who were rushing after the peddler who was bringing them all sorts of bling. Yeah. Yeah. Um... But nothing in this play. Uh, uh, Sarah. Oh, but wasn't he a welcome relief? Mm. I mean, after all that <laughs> posturing, endless posturing, it was suddenly really great to have a, a, a comic character enter the scene. Um, it was like a palate cleanse, I, I, I felt. Um, and particularly, um, you know, because we've just had Hercules, uh, doing all his posturing and now we've got Mars, you know, doing more of the same. And I mean, I, I, I made a choice with Mars to kind of play him a certain way, but I'm fairly certain he's probably not meant to be played that way. I'm fairly certain he's, he's meant to be kind of very manly and heroic as, as, as well. Um, so yeah, you've got, you've got a, 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 another sort of male full God this time, instead of a demigod, just, just, just being a complete ass, and then to have this comic character come in and and you know the bathos of that uh you know up to undercut all these heroic figures i i was just like oh thank god finally i, I feel we could do with a bit more of that in this play honestly alan i i must admit in some ways and this reference may not strike with uh, some some of the other readers here on the grounds of age and cultural background but you could almost play homer as uh the frankie howard lurkio character and then as gallus he comes on in his sort of more comic persona yeah he's blind isn't he homer is blind yes yeah i mean it's difficult to be funny and blind but but the, there is the rhythm of the, the oh. sort of the pro the prologue, mm. <laughs> which I was trying to resist doing because bits of it were just were leading him in that direction. I mean, Homer has a lot of, there's a lot going on in those Homer mm. speeches. Oh yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it does seem like a, a screeching U-turn to suddenly bring on this comedy character and as Sarah said it does provide some nice light relief and it's just a shame that there aren't a few more occasions on which something like that hasn't happened to, to break it up a little bit more. Yes I mean Amphitryon Servant was a big one. Mm. Uh, was that in Silver? I think that was Silver and I don't think mm. I was here for Silver. Uh, I may, may be wrong we've done so many darn things I've <laughs> lose the track. Eric. It was, it was the silver one uh, where, you know, Golden Tower or whatever, um, and then I and all that stuff, and sort of stealing, dove stealing um, the servant's identity, basically, <laughs> going like sort of, yeah, all that, all those shenanigans. That was actually fun to do, though. Um, and and this bit was fun as well. I mean, sort of going, oh yeah, I'll never fall asleep. And then as soon as they turn around, <laughs> it's very standard comedy. Like nothing could possibly make me fall asleep. Yeah. yeah. But it's quite late in the play as well. It's kind of like Act Four or Five. So. Like, yeah, it's, wow. act, it's, it's act four, or as you say, five. I mean, God knows where we are. Uh, I, I seem to I seem to think our act divisions here, as far as I can remember, were completely arbitrary. It's Homer. Let's call it a new act. 
uh, was more or less the editorial principle we were working on. Um, Elizabeth. Yeah, I was struck by Phoebus's voyeurism there. And I, was it me or was there a threesome with Mars, Venus, and someone else? Not Gallus, Gallus was to keep watch. But was it was there a threesome here, or was or was it just the two of them? I think it was just the two, and then Aurora turns up to herald the dawn. To herald uh, Phoebus. To yeah, basically as as uh, Phoebus's advance guard, as it were. Yeah. I mean, one of the problems is that they, they've got so many alternative names and epithets that sometimes two in a bed can seem like five. <laughs> but as yeah. Gallus points out, they haven't got any sheets. <laughs> Notices yeah, I, I, things yeah. like that. <laughs> I, I, I did like that detail. Like, well, enjoy lying on the hard <laughs> ground. Yeah. Eh. Shall we go into final thoughts? It's probably time. Uh, do we want to, uh, does anybody want to kick off or shall I pick someone at random? I shall pick someone at random. Rachel, you've been picked at <coughs> random. Haha. Uh -huh. um, no, I'm just thinking over what Sarah said before is, uh, you know, about Heracles and like the likability of these people and if they were meant to be liked uh, or not. Um, and I've, I've, I've gone, I think we've had these like conversations before of like, you know, how horrible some of these characters are and how hypocritical they are like with the other age plays. And that's like reoccurrent because there's so much stuff that um, <laughs> comes up and that, you know, some of like, it's problematic. And at the same time, it's an interesting like psychology, like things that these you know, people are doing um, and, and the interpretation of that from audiences at the time and modern audiences, but um, oh, oh my gosh, what am I trying to say even, but um, uh, how we did Gammer Girton's needle last uh, week, how that's just like outrageous and played to the max for the comedy that it's almost like a panto. Not that I think this one or this series was played to pantos, but I feel like it was a very um, pushing the the limits of what people would find acceptable, and like how Turkish plays, you know, push things out of countries or like more outrageous stuff. The setting isn't in the UK proper. That it's one of these sort of things that's a uh, so supposed to be a little salacious for audiences, you know, and the glamour of the action. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alan, you w had to take on extra parts, parts that you had no idea even existed when you well, came into I, the room. I, I, I knew they existed because I'd, I'd actually looked at the breakdown of who was on stage when, but uh, I'm still very confused by the sheer number. I mean, the Act four, I think, has 24 different speakers on at various points in all sorts of possible combinations. Um, and the fact that we haven't been able really to find any convincing points at which to break it into scenes doesn't help. And the whole episodic nature of this whole down play, um, I haven't seen any reason to revise my previous suggestion that the words may have been going on in the background but I, I think mm. most of what the audience were there for was the spectacle mm. um, you know and you could almost see this as being a proto mask because I think this is contemporary roughly with the beginning of the uh, the mask seat, mask um, concepts that we've seen in a courtly environment um, but this done for a more general public, um, you know, and fine, we've got the costumes, we've got the special effects, um, and I mean, it reminds me to a set, I know others have referred to sort of 
hero movies and, and so on, which is a genre I don't particularly follow. But, you know, you, it, it's the SFX that people are there for rather than any sort of plot line. I, I can't agree with you more. Um, I mean, we're well into the masks, uh, the Jacobean masks period. And I must say, I felt that when Aurora arrived with the seasons and the hours and the days and what have you, who took no part in it, mm. they said nothing, they came on, they went off. It seemed perfectly obvious to me that there were a missing stage direction, music plays, they dance and sing. Bring, bring on the dancing girls. Yes, I mean, I mean well, no. Actually, not bring on the dancing girls, but, um, but certainly I, I, I felt that here we we had um, an opportunity for dance. Uh, in fact, an imperative for dance. Um, let's move on. It's uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I just found the comments very fascinating. Um, I lit. I had a little look at um, the Frankie Howard Lurkio character that um, Alan was describing, and it reminded me of um, I Claudius, mm. that kind of thing. Um, but I, 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 I think that the play is kind of redeeming itself a little bit. It's like a lot of the comments we've had. I think that Haywood knows knows that okay that it needs interludes it needs some passion it needs vibrant female characters but it also needs this spectacle which I think that we've seen a lot of today this kind of spectacular moments these warring moments um Rachel talked about the Turkish plays and it did remind me of one of those as well um with the kind of scaling of the walls of the of this town and of the city and then taking over. Um, we've seen a lot of kings die. Um, it's action packed, like a lot of the Marvel Avengers series, but it does know the moments that we need. It just doesn't always bring them to us in the order that we might like for a modern audience. But I think for an early modern audience, it would have hit the right notes. It would have landed all of those beats. Yeah, I think it, it's for us now. We're used to it being th this on on the on the on the moment of a, you don't get a little bit bored. And we we described the text as stodgy last time, and I would take that back now. I don't think it's stodgy. I think it's a spectacle, um, and I think that it's rich and it's dense. I would say it was dense, not stodgy. That's a, it's a good distinction. Um, Eric? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. Like, there's a part we're going, if we played this at pace, how would it go? Because uh, obviously we're stopping and starting a lot and that kind of thing. But there's a part of me going, if you play it really fast, then it just, I think a lot might be lost. Like, it would have to be an audience that knows the play or, like, knows... Um, that is familiar with the characters although I guess that you can like you know if you have an academic audience for example or, or like people who know about classical literature then okay yeah they would know sort of what I mean a mo modern audience not an early modern one <laughs> uh, th they would get the references and stuff um, but yeah I don't know the the so all the all the spectacle stuff must have been like for the groundlings or something and all the sort of high romance uh, kind of you know like the venus and adonis scenes that's just i don't know it was very pretty um <laughs> it was just gorgeous um and then you've got like mars coming in it's a complete contrast to adonis don't we? um <laughs> yeah it's just well, interesting Tina. yeah yeah and i don't know it's just sort of an interesting compilation of characters as well, just like, because it, it is that thing of, here are the top highlights of Greek myth kind of thing, but then it has a narrative if you don't know the, if you haven't seen the previous two, um, that won't really make sense unless you're well read. Thanks. Uh, Sarah. Hmm. 
Mm, yeah, really interesting comments. I, I, I liked what Elizabeth said about it being dense. Um, dense is, is the word. I, yesterday, when people t were talking about it being stodgy, I didn't really feel that it was. I quite enjoyed it. I, I, I enjoyed the pace of the action. I thought it was quite a good romp. Today, I've struggled far more with it, it has to be said. And I think it's because of that density, because you've got layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of machismo, effectively, which um, I lose patience with. But I, I realise I am probably not Haywood's intended audience, just like I'm not the intended audience for, say, uh, you know, a modern day superhero film. Uh, you know, which we've been comparing this with, because when I go and see those films, even though I enjoy them up to a point, I always find that the big battley battley um, scenes at the end go on for at least five to ten minutes longer than I can tolerate. It's like I'm, I, I, I love a good fight scene and I'm with it and I'm with it and I'm with it and I'm just like, oh, we're not finished yet all of a sudden I, and I suddenly lose lose patience. And I think that's probably what happened to me today. I lost patience. It was just too many layers of similarity all one on top of the other to, to make that very very dense whole until that final scene that we did um with uh with venus and mars and and i i really enjoyed that for me that was a real palate cleanse um but i like you helen I, that that stage direction enter aurora attended with seasons days and hours what I really wanted there was a Ben Johnson description. I I, I really wanted a, a, a Ben Johnson to suddenly step in from the wings and say, oh, let me describe to you what Aurora is wearing. She is wearing a train of magenta, you know, overwatch it with stars spangled upon her skirt and yellow stockings or whatever. I, 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 I really wanted that at that point because I think that is the way um, to look at this and I think um, I know what you mean Eric about like if you play it perhaps at pace the audience might lose something but I think that is the only way you can play this because it is so dense you can't afford to wade through it you've got to just kind of you've got to push through it and you've got to make the most of the spectacle um, I think that is the only way you've got to really play up that visual gorgeousness and yes music and dancing and add all that in I think that's the only way you could make that work for a modern audience. And, and to be honest, I'm in spite of what we've talked about with Spectacle, I'm wondering actually if this would be a good one for Zoom, um, because I think one way to make it um, palatable is to like literally break it down into 15 minute chunks and do like 15 minute episodes, uh, which of course is something that you could do um, or, or, in a digital medium you you know you couldn't really do that on a on stage um but if you could combine that spectacle with a very very short uh like chunks of digital format i think that could be a way to 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 kind of make it um sort of digestible for a modern day audience uh but it's yeah, I'm going to miss the third part tomorrow. And normally, having having done first two parts of a play, I would be gutted about missing the third part. And I have to say, with this, I'm I'm not overly distraught that I'm going to miss the end. But I do hope you get more gallus. Oh well, he's got to wake up sometime. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, thank you very much. I have been through everybody, haven't I? Yes. Um, Apart from yourself, Helen. Ah, oh, well, I want to direct the um, the Red Boar Hunt Feast episode. That would be good. Yeah, I, I mean, I see this very much as a, a big television epic, uh, which would divide it up into chunks. Um, and you've got the ad breaks for people to to uh, decompress a bit, but yeah, I think it, I, th I I think it has a lot of potential. I think I think these plays are getting better than metallic plays. Anyway, I think we've got to come to an end now. So all that remains is for you to wave at the audience. And for me to thank you very much for your excellent reading and to say, anywhere with you, sister. <laughs> <laughs>